We sure do appreciate uh, everyone's presence this morning. Appreciate uh, those who have led us in our worship today. And uh, everyone in the pew for uh, participating so well. What an encouraging service it's been to me so far. The good singing and uh, just a very encouraging and I appreciate it a, a great deal. Uh, as as uh, you've noticed, we have begun reading from 2 Corinthians in our readings on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. So I'd like to turn over to that place this morning, the book of 2 Corinthians, and talk about a passage from, uh, from that letter uh, for a little while today. And In fact, we're going to talk about the passage we're going to read this evening in our, our reading in worship from chapter 2. Uh, the passage deals with a situation that existed in the church at Corinth that had been addressed in some ways prior to that, but they needed to continue to address it in the the appropriate way. It has to do with a man who had caused some offense. Uh, And I don't know the man's name, and as far as the book of 2 Corinthians is concerned, Paul doesn't specify exactly or explicitly what the offense was. Now through the years there have been a lot of people who have tied this passage to the 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the man that was living with his father's wife. And that's really what we're going to take up today. Although a lot of commentators uh, don't don't, don't make that connection. But that's where we're going to look at it today. And we can make the points. I think the points that we make today will be legitimate points, whether that's exactly the case or not. Again, it's interesting to me, we we don't know this man's name. Paul isn't trying to embarrass the man. Even in 1 Corinthians, we don't know his name. And so there may be a good reason for that. Paul doesn't want to uh, further embarrass the man or further shame the man, especially if he's tried to make some corrections between the time 1 Corinthians was written and the time 2 Corinthians was written. What we want to do this morning is think about what had happened, what the situation was, what the church was to do about that situation in the beginning, and then from 2 Corinthians what the church was to do about that situation as well. And so, we'll begin back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and then we'll make our way to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know the situation of the church in Corinth. Corinth was a a very immoral city. It had flourished from about 400 B.C. to about 150 B.C. It was destroyed by the Romans, and then rebuilt by Julius Caesar. And after it was rebuilt by Julius Caesar... It grew very quickly, became a large cosmopolitan city uh, very rapidly once it had been rebuilt. There were two ports at the city of Corinth, and then just across the isthmus at Sincrea, there was a port at each place. And so ships are coming in uh, from the east and the west, docking there in the city of Corinth, either unloading and loading, or sailors stopping there to take some rest and things like that. And so a lot of people are there making their fortune, uh, losing a fortune in the city of Corinth. And so when you have uh, people away from home, you have some people with too much money, some people with not enough money, that's sort of a recipe for immorality. And that's what you find in the city of Corinth. It became a very immoral place. One of the ancient writers, in fact, coined a word, uh, Corinthi. Corinthiazo, to act like a Corinthian, which means to be sexually immoral. And so, this was a very immoral place, an ungodly place, an idolatrous place, And uh, but there was a church there. In fact, when Paul went to Corinth, God told him, I want you to continue to preach in this place because I have a lot of people here. And so there was a church established there, despite the fact that, as one writer says, Corinth was at once the New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas of the ancient world. (laughs) And that's a a, a pretty vivid description. Many of the brethren, many of the Christians in the church at Corinth had come out of immoral backgrounds. You might remember 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, which says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, or idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, or homosexuals, or thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And so some of the brethren, some of the new Christians in the city of Corinth had been swindlers and idolaters and 
fornicators and homosexuals, and they had come out of that out of that kind of culture and out of that kind of lifestyle uh, and and into Christ. However, apparently some did not entirely leave the world behind when they became Christians. Uh, one writer uh, wondered if there was more uh, church in Corinth or more Corinth in the church. <laughs> and, and so some people had a difficult time leaving their past entirely behind. And that seems to be the case here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says in verse 1, it is actually reported that there is immorality, a sexual immorality among you, an immorality of such kind as not does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And so here is a man who in a sexual way is with his father's wife. And so this particular individual seems to have had a difficult time breaking away from the immorality of the city around him and became involved in an immoral, immoral situation. The fact that Paul does not refer to the woman involved as his mother suggests that it may be a stepmother. Now, not his natural mother, but his father's wife. Uh, that is, a, a woman that his father has married who is not this man's wife. And so, uh, perhaps that uh, explains some of the situation. We're not told anything about the father at the time of the relationship. He has his father's wife. Well, what happened to the father? Is the father still living? Has he died? Is he divorced? Well, well none, of, none of that information is told to us, although we might wonder about it. This is a situation that the law of Moses forbade. If you go back to the book of Leviticus and look at chapter 18 and verses 7 and 8, you'll find that a man is not to become involved in, a, in, in, in an immoral way with the wife of his father. Leviticus 18 verse 7 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. And the idea conveyed by the phrase uncover the nakedness of means to become involved in a sexually immoral way with uh, the um, uh, with, with the wife of your father. Uh, this is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You're not to uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. She belongs to your father, and she is. It would be inappropriate for you to become involved with her in that way. And so this is something that was forbidden by the law of Moses, but Paul emphasizes the high degree of perversity of this sin by saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, not even the Gentiles accept this. <laughs> and so this is a situation, as bad as Corinth was, and as immoral and as much of lack of restraint as there was, not, not even the Gentiles accept this kind of situation. To make matters worse, verse 2 tells us that Many in the church at Corinth were not ashamed of this. They weren't embarrassed by it. They were arrogant and puffed up about it. Verse 2 says, you become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. I wondered for a long time, as I read that and thought about that, how in the world could anybody be arrogant and puffed up about this kind of situation until recently? <laughs> well, we live in a culture that doesn't want to exclude any. We want to be inclusive. We want to be tolerant. We want to be broad-minded. We don't want to be judgmental. And after all, these are two consenting adults, apparently. And who are we to say that something like that is wrong? Who are we to, to be judgmental and ex exclusive? And so, no doubt, there would be people today very proud of their broad-mindedness and liberal approach to a situation something like this. Now, I'm not saying that was exactly their thought process, but uh, I can see now how it might be that someone be puffed up about a situation like this. Paul says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. You're arrogant about it, you're puffed up about it, but your boasting is not good. What does Paul tell them to do here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Well, there are several things that he says that they should do. In verse 2 he says that the one who has done this deed should be removed from your midst. 
In verse 5 he says, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so, you want to live as a person in the world, even though you're supposed to be a Christian? Okay, we're going to put you in the world, in Satan's domain, and maybe uh, cut off from the fellowship of God's people and the advantages of God's people. And Maybe that will help you to see that you need to make some corrections. He tells them in verse 6, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. And so, clean out this leavening influence, this evil influence that's likely to spread among the church at Corinth. He tells them in verse 9, not to associate with immoral people. And then clarifies that in verse 11. I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater, a viler, a drunkard, or a swindler. Don't even eat with such a one. And then in verse 13 he says, to remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And so he says, remove him in verse 2. I've... My judgment is, and my decision is to deliver this one to Satan, verse 5. Clean out the old leaven, verse 7. Don't associate him with, with him, verses 9 through 11. And remove the wicked man, verse 13. Paul is asserting his apostolic authority. You can see that very plainly in verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled together, and I with your spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus... And he continues. And so Paul is speaking as an apostle in in an authoritative way. This is what you should do in this situation. You're tolerating this situation is not good. You're boasting about it is not good. You really ought to be ashamed of yourselves and take some, some measures against this situation. And what's the purpose of all this? This disciplinary action that they were to take? Well, verse 5 says, if this is done... So that his soul might be saved, his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And then in, in a little bit later, he, he talks about a little leaven, leavening the whole lump. If we allow these kinds of situations to continue, Paul says, well then, the, in, that influence, that compromise with immorality will spread throughout the whole group until eventually the whole church is affected by it. And so... And so we're going to save this man's spirit in, as far as his individual spirit is concerned, but we're also doing this in order to have a positive effect on the church as a whole. Well, this, this is not the only statement in the New Testament that speaks about this kind of thing. Look at, look at a few others. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 6, and again, all of these are written... Like, like 1 Corinthians 5, deal with a particular situation. So 2 Thessalonians deals with a particular situation that was going on at that place and time. But he says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away or withdraw yourselves from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. And then verse 14 If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him, so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The idea of living an unruly life here simply means to live a disorderly way, an undisciplined way, uh, lazy or idle or negligent. those, Those are the ideas that are conveyed by this word. And so, here's a person who's simply negligent in his duty. And he's begun to live an unruly life, a a life that is not ordered and does not conform to the teaching of the apostle. If anyone doesn't obey what we've taught you in this epistle, well then, you are to withdraw yourselves from him. In Romans chapter 16, we find another similar passage. Romans 16, verses 16 and 17. Paul says there that the, the brethren should... Mark, keep your eye on what the New American Standard Bible says, but mark those who are causing dissension and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. So these are people that are being divisive. And all of these things recall the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins, go to and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. 
If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the word of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And so Jesus says, if a brother sins. And so here are several, um, several situations that require this kind of attention. Uh, if, if a brother is immoral, like 1 Corinthians 5, well then, this kind of disciplinary action should be taken. If he's, if he's negligent in his duty and living an unruly life, that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If a person is divisive, if a person persists in sin, and he refuses to listen to his brethren when they come and try to encourage him to, to do better, well then, these, th- this kind of action needs to be taken. And so how do these things apply to the church today? Well, our, our goal, what we're trying to do is follow the New Testament pattern when we, when we see the New Testament pra- church practicing a thing or being taught to practice a thing. That, that's what we want to do. And so in the New Testament, churches are taught to address situations in which brothers or sisters persist in sin by administering discipline against them. The passages cited above, the ones we've just looked at, indicate that these sins may involve moral issues, disorderliness, negligence, divisiveness, or simply sin. And it's not an occasional slip. That's not something that we, we just, oh, I made a mistake and I, you know, this is something I shouldn't know. This is some, someone who's persisting in this, in this sin. The discipline should include several attempts to persuade the offender to repent. First of all, teaching ought to be done. <laughs> about right and wrong. Secondly, personal exhortation and admonition. That's from the words of Jesus. If a brother sins, you go to him in private. And so here's, a, here's one step, a personal admonition or exhortation. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't, here's a second attempt. Take one or two with you, so that the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word might be established. And if he listens to you and makes some correction, that's great. Doesn't need to go any further than that. But if he refuses to listen, there's a third attempt. Tell it to the church. And then then there's a fourth attempt. (laughs) If he refuses to hear the church, well then, uh, the church is to withdraw themselves from the offender. Now, I I think I'd make the observation that in in my experience, it might be limited and this might not be correct, but most of these situations are are cleared up on the first attempt. You know, if, if I were to, out here in the parking lot, something happened, I'd get mad, you know, and I'd lose my temper, and, and Chuck comes up to me and says, Bob, I'll, I'll talk to you about what happened. You know, you, you really lost your temper out there, and you said some things that you really shouldn't have said, and you know, you, you, said, you shouldn't have done that. Most of the time, I think I would say, you know, Chuck, you, you're right. You know, you're right. I, I really shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that anymore. And in my experience, that's on the first attempt <laughs> to, to, to correct. Most of these things are, are, uh, are clarified and resolved, but not, not all the time. And so sometimes more attempts need to be made. Well, I can hear some people objecting. I have never heard of this. <laughs> I have never heard of a church doing anything like this. I thought the church was a haven for sinners. I thought this was a place where sinners could come and be welcomed and and not not excluded, not not removed. And how can we be so judgmental and and act this way? And and I would probably have to admit that there are not many churches who, who really apply this teaching. But when brethren who know better... Now, I'm not talking about a little babe, spiritual infant who doesn't know what his responsibilities are. I'm talking about somebody who knows better than to behave in these ways that we've talked about, becomes non-responsive to attempts to persuade them to repent. Well, what choice does the church have? It's right there. It's right in the text. It's right there. <laughs> this is what we're to do. And since our endeavor is to follow the apostolic doctrine and teaching and example... Well, that's, that's what we want to do. And so when churches do this, they're merely doing their duty. Well, that's not the end of the story. 
But let's look at the sequel. Now, now that brings us to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, 2 Corinthians is written about a year later, or, or at least in the next year. And so some things must have happened during this course of time. It seems that the church applied this discipline, and, and things, were, things happened. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll begin reading in, in verse 6. Well, let's begin reading in... Well, let's, be, let's just begin reading in verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you may know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has called sorrow, he's called sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Now, it's a little difficult to know sometimes exactly what Paul has in mind in these words, and he talks about a previous letter and a desire to visit and things like that. But really for our purposes, verse 6 begins the key passage. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. All right, you, you've done enough. All right. The, uh, sufficient punishment has been administered. And so he goes on in verse 7 to say, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort. Another word for comfort is encourage. You should forgive and encourage him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. That's interesting, isn't it? Reaffirm your love. And so you, you claim to love him. Do you love him enough to forgive him and encourage him? For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. <laughs> you know. I, I suppose for some of us, the test would be, are you willing to discipline? But here Paul says, the test of your obedience is, are you willing to forgive him and encourage him? So I want to know if you're going to be obedient in all things. Some of us are better at punishing than forgiving, unfortunately. But uh, that's what Paul says that uh, they are to do. Verse 10 says, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And so what's happened in the meantime? Well, the man, if, if, if this is a reference back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man has repented. You remember, Jesus says in Matthew 18, you go to your brother, if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. And so apparently, again, if this is a reference to 1 Corinthians 5, the man has listened. He's listened. And he's broken off the relationship. He's repented. He's brought his life into conformity with the gospel. And the brother has been saved. The brother has been gained. And so now Paul tells the Corinthians to forgive to comfort or encourage and to reaffirm their love for the man. Forgiveness would be a test for them. Will they obey in all things, even to the point of forgiving? You know, we, we may have within us, it may just be human nature, a desire to make sure the scales of justice are balanced. Somebody does wrong, they're going to be punished. And we're going to make sure that they're punished sufficiently, <laughs> you know. And sometimes we may go beyond, really beyond what is required so that the punishment is, is really out of line with, uh, with the offense. Especially if a brother for, for, uh, if repents. Now it's time to forgive. Why, why might a person not want to forgive? Well, it just might be, well, I'm going to make sure he's punished. You know? I'm going to make sure that he's punished severely enough. Or it may be that, you know, if we don't forgive, we still maintain a little bit of control over the brother and a little bit of a superiority over him. Now, for whatever the reason, these people had to be told to forgive. When forgiveness is a basic Christian responsibility. It's, our, it's just basic, isn't it? To forgive. Well, let's note some passages that teach us to forgive. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. In chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus, Matthew 18, 
It says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Peter, you're way off. <laughs> you're not even close. <laughs> no, 70 times seven. And then Jesus tells a story about the two debtors. One that owed a lot of money and was forgiven his debt. Another slave, another debtor owed that man a reasonable sum of money and yet his, uh, the man he borrowed the money from just wasn't willing to forgive And so that man was held responsible. Verse 34, The Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that that was owed him. And verse 35, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. It's interesting that he adds that last little phrase, If each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart. From the heart. And there are, there are several other passages, of course. Uh, Luke 17, 3 and 4, If your brother sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times says, I repent, forgive him. Colossians 3, we are to, to forgive. I, I guess I'm partial to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 because uh, my mother quoted it to us as children. Uh, well, frequently. As we would get into an argument, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And I want to talk a little bit about that last expression, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. You know, for God forgives us out of His abundance of mercy and His grace and His good will. God is under no obligation to forgive us. But we have an obligation to forgive. If we have been forgiven, we must forgive you know, uh, when a person acknowledges his sin, like this man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 must have done, you know, you're right, this is a bad relationship, I need to get out of it, I need to do better. And so when a person acknowledges his sin, he humbles himself. And when a person forgives, he humbles himself as well. Because he's recognizing his own sin. You know, I'm a sinner too. And I've been forgiven. And so, I forgive you. And so, both parties <laughs> humble themselves, in a sense, make themselves weak. And in making themselves weak, they become strong. And together, they become really strong. <laughs> and isn't that what Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10? When I am weak, then I am strong. When I acknowledge my sin, when I face it, what's the first step to recovery? You've got to admit you got a problem. You know? When I acknowledge it, I'm on the road to becoming strong. And when I humble myself and forgive, because I understand I'm in the same boat with this brother, well, then I can become strong. You know, I, I'd hate to stand before God in the judgment, wouldn't you? And God asked me, Why didn't you forgive him? I forgave you. Why didn't you forgive him? I forgave you. That would be a tough question to have to face in the judgment day, wouldn't it? Paul indicates that some who are not forgiven will be overcome or may be overcome with excessive sorrow. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. And that may be one of the, the, the devices of Satan that he refers to in verse 11. And so he's telling the church, you need to forgive this man, you need to encourage him, you need to reaffirm your love for him. He's feeling bad enough, he's overcome with sorrow, don't allow that to continue. But but build him up, encourage him, help him to make a new start, lest he become discouraged and fall away. Well, who would want to continue in a church that wouldn't forgive? I mean, would you? (laughs) Would you want to continue to be a part of a church that won't forgive? When you've done everything you can. Look, I've admitted, I I was weak, I did wrong, I succumbed to temptation, I shouldn't have. I acknowledge that. I want to do better. I intend to do better. I don't care. You know, you hadn't paid enough yet. You know, Well, that's, that's not the way God has dealt with us. And it shouldn't be the way we deal with each other. It's an occasion of joy when a sinner repents. Luke chapter 15. Remember the stories that Jesus tells? He tells three stories. There's the story of the lost sheep that was found, and there was rejoicing. 
There's the story of the lost coin that was found and there was rejoicing. And there was the story of the lost boy, the prodigal son, who returned home. He was found. He was lost, but he was found. And, and there was rejoicing. When a sinner repents, it's an occasion, it's an occasion of joy. And so we need to be willing to forgive, willing to encourage, reaffirming our love for each other, and rejoice. Rejoice that one who is lost is, is found. Well, I'll just say in closing that, you know, there are two parts to this sermon. And we, we really need to do both of them. We need to do the first part, where if people fall into sin, we need to take measures to try to correct that. That might start with teaching, my personal, a personal visit and, and ed, uh, exhortation and, and encouragement. Might get a couple more involved. So there are lots, several attempts to draw a person back. But, but we need to exercise the first part of the sermon. We, we need to do that if we're going to do what the church in the New Testament was taught to do. We also need to do the second part, which is when a person repents, forgive, forgive, and affirm our love for them. Well, if you're here today and not a Christian, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ who came to save those who are lost, who came to bring sinners to repentance. And when they come to Him, there is great joy. And so we encourage you, if you're ready to become a Christian, that you put your faith in Jesus and repent of your sins, that you'll be willing to stand up and say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized so that your sins might be washed away. If you're already a Christian but not right with God, whatever you need to do to get right with God today, we encourage you to do it and we can help you. We invite you to come as we stand and sing together.